Hello, you're listening to a very special episode of Popcorn Pals, where I sit down with the writer-director of Red, White and Royal Blue, Matthew Lopez. I'm Timmy Fland, movie buff, and this is Popcorn Pals, a popcorn podcast with Lee and Tim spinoff, where I'll be joined by a rotation of movie-loving legend guest hosts to discuss the latest and greatest new big screen releases. It's the same salty fun with some new flavours. So let's talk red, white, and royal blue for a minute, then jump straight into my chat with writer-director Matthew Lopez. In red, white and royal blue, when the son of the American president and Britain's prince, public feud threatens to drive a wedge in US-British relations, the two are forced into a staged truce that sparks something deeper. Red, white and royal blue is directed by Matthew Lopez from a screenplay by Lopez and Ted Malaware based on the novel by Casey McQuiston. The film stars Taylor Zaka Perez, Nicholas Galitzine, Clifton Collins Jr., Sarah Shari, Rachel Hilson, Stephen Fry, and Uma Thurman. As the saying goes, there's a thin line between love and hate. But for Alex, son of the US president, and Britain's Prince Henry, there will be a more challenging line to cross when their longtime rivalry develops into a romance. Red, White and Royal Blue is a fun romantic comedy in the tradition of classic Hollywood romances, but with very contemporary characters. Based on Casey McQuiston's critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Red, White and Royal Blue marks the feature film writing and directing debut of Tony Award winning playwright Matthew Lopez of The Inheritance fame. I had the pleasure of chatting with director, co-writer and executive producer Matthew Lopez about this modern fairy tale that defies conventions. The Tony Award winning artist makes his feature film debut here with some really strong connections to the movie's source material and personal connection with the character of Alex, a fellow Latin A character. Lopez and I discuss the importance of Latin A representation in film, his incredible desire to bring this story to the world, how it feels to share a queer story like this one with audiences, how he wishes the book was around when he was young, and the surprise romantic comedy he drew inspiration from. All this and so much more, so... Let's take a listen. Did I do something wrong? Do you ever wonder who you'd be if you were an anonymous person in the world? I have no idea what you're talking about. You're as thick as it gets. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. Congratulations on Red, White and Royal Blue. I had a really fun time watching your movie. Thank you so much. I had a fun time making it. Good. I bet you did. Now, uh, of course, it, it's it's very cute. It's very fun, like I said, but it's it's also an inspiring story with a queer relationship at its core. So yay for that. What did you love most about Casey McQuiston's novel that it's based on? It was Alex and Henry. I mean, it really w- began and ended for me with those two characters. As a queer Latin uh, creator, I, I read Alex and I was just immediately presented with a character I'd never seen in literature before. Alex really is just so unusual uh, in the best way possible. And he, for me, of course, was like the way I I, I found my way into the book. And then Henry as a character in relation to Alex as a character. Casey has the ability to create people who really feel like they're in the room with you as you're reading the book. It it really inspired in me this, this incredible desire to actually bring them into the world. So... I wish I could say it was selfless, but it was really, really the most selfish thing ever because I just wanted to like spend more time with these characters and I I figured out a way to do that. Yeah, well, it's pretty exciting that you connected so much with a story that you then had the opportunity to turn into your directorial debut. So that's pretty special that you felt so connected with a source material straight out of the gate to explore the whole world of filmmaking. I want to talk about Latin A representation that you mentioned before. Like you historically won a Tony Award for your work for Best Play for The Inheritance a few years ago as the first Latin A person to win in that category. A really beautiful, moving acceptance speech, by the way. I can only imagine what that would have been like to to say and experience up there with everybody. 
Now, your film sees not only two queer protagonists, but as you mentioned, Alex is part of the Latin A community. What were some of the cultural layers you wanted to see represented in Alex and his family unit in the movie? I mean, one of the things that, you know, the first the first thing you, if you are a member of any non-white community, if you're a member of any sort of non-cis straight community, you know that you are more than just the label that, that you or, or perhaps society places on you. And one of the things that I loved about Alex is that he's so multifaceted you know the the fact that he is bisexual the fact that throughout the story he discovers that he is bisexual the fact that that he is mexican-american that he's biracial which is which is my story as well the fact that he's from texas because there's a difference between being latin and from florida say like me and latin and from from texas and the fact that he's working class that he you know that 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 he unlike henry doesn't come from privilege um there are so many facets to alex as a Latin character, that made sense to me. There's a weird, other than the fact that neither of my parents are president of the United States, there's sort of a weird overlap between me and Alex. And so I understood him, and what I most understood was his complexity. And I thought that that was something you don't really see all that often uh, with Latin characters in in popular fiction. This real complexity to the character that I was very eager to bring to screen. Yeah, you see, Alex has such a significant character arc. I mean, so does Prince Henry, but Alex's is quite significant because, you know, this movie plays on the perception that you have of people as well. And there's one perception that you might have of Alex at the beginning of the movie, but you, I was really surprised to follow his journey. And, you know, he really grew into himself and his maturity as well as his own identity about who he is. The thing I always said to Taylor on set is that Alex is just as surprised by what is inside of him as the audience is. You know, Alex is going through, I mean, it's funny. Henry sort of arrives, sort of accepting who he is. Henry's journey is 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 trying to take who he really is and, and allow that to be his public persona. Alex's public persona is actually fairly true. What is missing from Alex is the sense that he actually has the ability, that there is something actually powerful in Alex and not just famous. I think Alex is, you know, when we meet Alex, he's sort of, for better or for worse, coasting on his fame, that is newfound. And what he realizes is that he can take that and turn it into something actually very positive. I think so many queer kids out there will relate to this film uh, with many, I guess, experiencing the same tormented inner turmoil about who they are right this moment as much as you know Alex and Henry do in the film I mean personally I grew up in the Catholic church so my sexuality was something that I repressed for a very long time um and there's nothing more terrifying and liberating than coming out right it's it's quite a moment how does it feel to be sharing a film like this with young queer kids to discover and see themselves in what I'm starting to really understand is that as a filmmaker of Red White and Royal Blue I am of a different generation and a set of experiences than the characters that I've depicted in this film and by and large the audience that this movie is made for. We have different experiences and one of the things I think is really beautiful is that we get to share this movie. I wish this book had been around when I was younger. I wish that I had had access to stories such as these. There's a part of me that is very envious that younger generations have access to this book and so many others like it. I would not be surprised if someone who is 21 or 22 probably would say there's not enough. And when I was 21 or 22, we were starving for anything. So Mm. I can see the progress because I've watched it transform in my own life. And I've been very privileged to be a part of that transformation as a storyteller in my own small way. But I would also not blame uh, the generation that, that this story is made for by insisting that it's not enough yet. Um, which I think is is their right to. I mean, I'm going to throw one of your own quotes at you, which I really love to just ladder, I mean, ladder up what you're just, I just want to warn you. It's okay. You can claim it. It's like, yeah, of course I said that. How is that? Yeah. yeah. Well, is it maybe just maybe this little fairy tale that we're telling can be a building block for change. So I think that really wraps up what you were saying. Yeah. So profound. Wow. I genuinely don't remember. I must have said it in an interview. I didn't write that. No, I think you did say it in an interview. That's okay. correct. Yeah. It sounds like something I would say. Even if I didn't say it, I'm going to claim it. Okay, good. <laughs> Obviously, uh, your film leans into the classic film tropes of the rom-com genre. What are some romantic comedies that you love that maybe 
sort of inform some of your writing and, and direction? Well, you know, it's funny when we started to look at examples, we couldn't find anything that was like Red, White and Royal Blue, the novel. When we were putting Red, White and Royal Blue, the movie together, there were no there were no examples for us. I knew that you couldn't go wrong uh, examining the old fashioned rom coms. I think there was really, really instructive. And we went way back. We looked at uh, the 1930s. Bringing Up Baby was perhaps one of the most influential films on on all of us as we were making this movie. There's something really madcap about that film. There's something really bananas about uh, about it. When you see Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant in that, you can see some some shadow of Alex and Henry in some way. And so when we were putting the movie together, I told my actors, uh, Taylor and Nick most especially, watch well, Bringing Up Baby. And one of the things that is really true about those old movies is they just put the two actors on camera together and like they didn't cut away. And a lot of the magic of those movies is watching the two actors on screen together, making magic as actors. And so one of the things that we were really interested in doing in this movie, and we did pull it off in many scenes, and I'm very proud of that, is it's just Taylor and Nick on screen. Yeah. And I try to keep the cutting to a minimum because like, there's there's no substitute for two actors at the height of their powers really having tremendous chemistry. You can see that in Bringing a Baby, and I'm hope I hope people will find that you can see that in Red, White, and Royal Blue. Well, you know what? I'm going to throw on Bringing Up Baby because uh, you, you've got me really interested to compare your film to that one. Your point about holding on moments that that scene by the jetty where you just hold on Henry is so beautiful and profound. Like you have so many options to cut away in in the medium of film, but you just hold on to that, and it sets up so much weight to what happens for the characters. For, for the rest of the movie. And I thought that was a really brave and really confronting and powerful way of, of, of representing that scene, that moment. I, I, I warned Taylor and Nick, I was like, you're going to wonder if I've fallen asleep because you're going to feel like the scene is over and you won't hear me say that. And, <laughs> and uh, don't worry, I haven't fallen asleep. Um, and yeah, I mean, but honestly, when you've got actors such as Nick and Taylor and Uma and Stephen Fry and Rachel Hilson and Sarah Shahi, why wouldn't you want to keep the camera going for as long as possible? You know, why would you want to end the shot before you got something else that's going to be magical from them? So I was really rich in options. I think the hardest part about cutting this movie was just sort of like, uh, which great take do you use? So I was rich in options from the from this cast. And um, yeah, if I could, I would have done the whole thing as a wonder and just sort of like let those actors, you know, work their magic. Thank you, Matthew, for your time. Uh, I've really loved talking to you. Take care. It's like there's a rope attached to my chest and it keeps pulling me towards you. Matthew Lopez was so lovely to chat with and his personal connection to the Red, White and Royal Blue book is a significant one and you can tell in his direction that it means a great deal. Red, White and Royal Blue is an escapist film. It's a bit of fun, guys. Perfect for a night in with a glass of red or white wine, and fall in love with the characters of Alex and Henry, as I'm sure you will. I hope you enjoyed this special interview episode of Popcorn Pals with the writer-director of Red, White, and Royal Blue, Matthew Lopez. I have many episodes more like this coming, folks, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a thing. Red, White and Royal Blue is available to stream on Prime Video from August 11 with a subscription to The Surface. And as always... Thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you next time. We are now on YouTube where you will find our latest celebrity video interviews. Simply search Popcorn Podcast with Lee and Tim and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing.